This is the Zero Downside Podcast brought to you by MoabTexas.com. Hello again, guys, and welcome to our episode two of Zero Downside. And today we have Dr. Wade McKenna, Michael Mitchell, and our special guest, Dr. Ken Brown. Dr. Ken's going to give us a little bit of background on him before we start off, give him a little shout out. And so you know the basis of what this episode is going to be about. Yeah, I want to just make sure I say a few things about Dr. Brown because I know he won't uh, be uh, <laughs> a, as, as flowery um, talking about himself. But um, Dr. Brown has, has had a very regenerative focus uh, in medicine. So when we talk about modern versus Western uh, or traditional, um, Dr. Brown's been outside of that paradigm for a long time um, as a gastroenterologist. So he um, does functional gastroenterology. Uh, actually does focus on um, taking care of the patient as a whole um, and understands um, functional anatomy um, and is a really well-trained physician and surgeon. Um, welcome to the show, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much. I can't uh, tell you how excited I am to be on episode two. This is perfect. <laughs> I did see the first one and it was really good. So you guys have a lot to talk about and it's a very exciting field that you guys are talking about. So thank you for having me on. I, I, I appreciate you coming on, obviously. Um, I'm pretty sure most people that are watching this now, since it's going to be sent to a, primarily a lot of our patients initially, um, saw me in the first podcast I well, did early at Dr. Brown's podcast. So you've been doing that show for how long? We're going up uh, three, three and a half years, something like that. Wow, yeah. Nice. yeah, I think we've been going there about that long. So What's yeah, you were, you were one of the, the first guests as well on our show. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. wow. That's wow. tradition. I like How ironic. Yeah, that. <laughs> Perfect. That makes that's. I love it when things come full circle. Right. Um, when I was on your show, you had a lot of very specific questions about um, an illness that now I know why you had a lot of specific questions about because um, after that, episode. Um, it wasn't within even a year uh, before we took care of you on another issue, right? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, it was just fortuitous that we had you on uh, just because I wasn't anticipating getting an injury or anything. Oh, it wasn't nice. like I was sitting on an injury. I actually <laughs> had something I happen. You were holding a card back. Yeah, mm -mm. No, no uh -uh. I was just really excited when we had you on. That was the first time I had heard anything about stem cells. Oh, wow. And what I had heard about it was just misinformation, really. And right. so when we had you on and you were discussing all these things, it was just a really exciting to realize that there is somebody with this kind of knowledge out there. And that right. is the that well, is the foreshadowing of what happened later. So Yeah, so especially with the with the bone marrow part of what we do, when you talk about a real stem cell and how the body does it, your you being able to take the understanding of healing, not not just throwing a treatment at someone and actually trying to help the body heal means probably more you've been focused on the actual healing of the surgery part than most orthopedic surgeons have for your whole career. Well, you had mentioned on the first episode that nutrition also, you guys right. are dealing with that. I'm, you know, all health begins and ends in the gut in my mm -hmm. world, so. Yeah, I mean, the, the immune system, one of the, one third of the stem cells function is immune modulation, right? And, and what you do, the immune system's in the gut, so. Um, that's why we talk about it. you can pour stem cells on something, but if they're not nutritional or hormonally sound, you're not going to get the same effect. You'll get something, but optimizing care is really what it's all about. And you've been doing that for people for a long time. And, and it's always evolving also, just like you guys. Right. Yeah. We, yeah I mean, nutritionally, the, like you, you've been really instrumental in, in some peptide therapy and things like that too, right? Yeah. I've been started getting into the peptides after learning about the stem cells and I'm real big into the, the functional supplement space as well. Uh, actually developing, you know, different ones and things like that. So that's amazing. Now we've, we've heard a lot of terms, uh, you know, gastroenterologists, we've heard modern medicine versus traditional medicine. Uh, we've heard functional medicine. So I explain to those that are listening and, and watching online, how do the two tie together between gastroenterology and functional medicine, right? How does, how does that fit in your yeah. practice? Well, so in my practice, the history is I'm a traditionally trained gastroenterologist and that would just be the typical training that somebody would get. And the Department of Gastroenterology is labeled as the Department of Gastroenterology and Nutrition. And looking back on my training, I had about eight minutes of nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> and we're supposed to be the experts in that, as far as doctors go. Right. Yeah. And yeah. we just didn't get any of that. Well, yeah. it, 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 I probably had two. 
He's yeah. an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that's why he's a specialist. Yeah. <laughs> he had four yeah, times exactly. the nutrition training. Four times training. the amount of nutrition training. Four, exactly. four times the amount of nutrition training. And when I get out in practice, you start realizing that there's just all these different diseases that people get labeled that is just a trash can term. Mm-hmm. You have irritable bowel. You're irritable bowel with fibromyalgia. You know, every one of our fields has something. And there had to be more to that. And then during training, it's just, okay, we'll try this drug. Try this drug. Try this drug. Right. Yeah. And then that's how I started realizing there has to be more to this, uh, was doing pharmaceutical research and mm-hmm. just seeing how these drugs get developed. And I mean, I'm, you know, I was living on both sides. I was getting paid to do it. So it was, <laughs> you know, but then I could just see how much money they're investing in. And if there was a different way, like lifestyle changes. And so I started, you know, making different recommendations on diet. This is, you know, 18 years ago or whatever, when this all started. And so this was really novel at the time. Nobody was talking about let's use supplements mm-hmm. let's change the diet let's do different things and let's actually help you be well yes right? let's help you be well and you know change the whole model and so that's what functional medicine has sort of become and so you know got involved with that community and have met a lot of functional medicine doctors and i think that there is this paradigm shift that's moving towards that and the reason is is because people can tune into a podcast like this and learn about options mm-hmm. that maybe their traditional doctor would be like no don't mm-hmm. You know, I've, no, there's no science on that. I've, I've heard that so many yeah. times. And of course, they're yeah. going to believe the doctor because that's a lot of what the patients say yeah. is that, you know, I didn't know any different. I went to my specialist and they expect just in normal society, a doctor to have all the information that they know. And so they don't know any different. And yeah. I think that's really important that we're doing this. Yeah. And most Western medicine is not really science based anymore. Right. I mean, we both I'm not afraid to go back and look at the science and make decisions that may be a little anti-medical establishment because the medical establishment is meant as a revenue driver. And really, when you talk about big pharma, big healthcare, mm-hmm. organized healthcare, it's really one pocket. Mm-hmm. They just kind of shift money from side to side and, and continue to be a third of the GDP when health and wellness could be a lot less expensive path for the rest of your life if you invest in yourself and do the right things early. Are we allowed uh, yeah. to call it the so FDA that, that on this Western too? Medicine. Yeah. We, my son, we were, I just came back doing a vacation and we were driving back. We were in Portugal and we were listening to a podcast with Robert F. Kennedy when he was on Joe Rogan. And so it got, it just stimulated a lot of conversation. And if you could take the amount of money that we're spending on healthcare mm. and just shift it, you could bring people out of poverty. You can, I mean, you could reform cities. You could do all kinds of stuff. Right. But the way the model is, Look, we, we talk about all the time that people say, well, you know, when people ask, does insurance pay for any of this? And, my, I, you know, the answer is most, most likely no. Um, but they, they can't keep me from augmenting your surgery with it. But for the most part, people are trying to avoid surgery. But if, if there are certain paradigms like lateral epicondylitis and the elbow, um, if you don't fail PRP injections, work comp is very difficult to get someone approved to reconstruct that. That wasn't without a lot of effort because we've showed – Lots and lots of studies going back to the early, late 80s, early 90s uh, with Dr. Fabini in Italy that lateral epicondylitis injected with PRP or cells heals faster. The six month, two year, five year outcomes are way better than putting steroids in there. And most people don't fail that injection. So now work comp will pay for PRP injections, lateral elbow in, in Texas. If Medicare did that with one procedure, like partial thickness rotator cuff, one level back failure, What's published on the injections in a disc with back pain is way better five-year follow-up than what's published with, with surgery. Your chances of having another surgery in the first five years is over 30%, or over 60%, excuse me. Your chances of having two is over 30%. With the injections, your chance of having anything else done, as long as the diagnosis was made right, it was isolated back pain, you had a disc or tear, all the prerequisites, right? But your chances of having nothing else done at five years is 87%. So if you just took one surgery and the average amount of healthcare costs for one level fusion in a Medicare patient is about $250,000. If you just said you can't have that unless you fail the injections, most people would love that because no, no one wants to have a back fusion. They just don't want their back to hurt anymore. Mm-hmm. But if you gave people that option, the amount of people that would pick that injection, that's thousands of dollars instead of $250,000, it would be startling. And I think that would, it would be really easy to balance Medicare budget, keeping people healthier and balance mm-hmm. the insurance company's budget, keeping people healthier. But then the money doesn't leave to the same people. It's back in patients' pockets. Mm-hmm. It's into other 
needs and we're not having to overfund the medical establishment part of what we do, right? Yeah. The little perspective of just the steroid injections alone, like the what you just said about getting a steroid injection versus a PRP injection. Right. The fact that insurance will cover steroid or cortisol injection all day, every day, but you have to keep going and getting it every right. well, single day. Well, and steroids are, look, steroids yeah, are catabolic, exactly. right? They take catabolism, anabolic, anabolic to make things better, catabolic tear stuff apart. Corticosteroids are catabolic. They can't make a protein healthier. They can't make a cell healthier. They can denature and ruin everything. So parcel thickness tears become full thickness tears. If you want to do that, put steroid in someone's tendon and kill it, right? Mm. Yeah. Drives away blood supply. It doesn't yeah. drive angiogenesis. But it, there's a code for it. And <laughs> Insurance will cover it. the doctor it. thinks he's helping you. <laughs> I, I think. I want to think that, right? But but the first stage, of, that's kind of the first stage of surgery, right? Like we we'll inject them with a couple steroids, and then when it doesn't, when that stops helping, let me know, and we'll we'll open you up. Right? So so we're talking about traditional versus modern medicine, right? Being moving over to the functional side. What was the change, right? What was the catalyst that made you say, "Hey, I I want to change my approach." So you mentioned earlier, you know, the, the the pharmaceutical side of the practice and being a gastroenterologist, and then moving into the functional medicine side. What what was that switch for you? Well, the real switch happened when I was doing pharmaceutical research, and we were looking. At, I was um, part of new paradigm shift in irritable bowel syndrome where irritable bowel working with some doctors in California, they determined that bacteria could be at the root of this. Mm -hmm. And so you start getting into bacteria growing where it shouldn't be. And the drug that we were looking at cost a ton, even now, and this was 18 years ago, uh, really wasn't going to help this huge segment. And what we're talking about is like bloating and constipation and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so he said we're not going to be able to help that group because of the organism that actually produces methane gas, which is what's causing all these issues. And so he's like, yeah, that's too bad. And we don't have any, anything to really treat these people. Well, then went into the literature and you start looking back at various countries also. Now we have the ability to translate different yeah. research. Into <laughs> yeah. And I figured out that we could do, we could actually treat those people naturally. And that's how I got into the, this whole space of let's start thinking outside the box and seeing other ways to help. Because otherwise, when a doctor says, oh, there's no research on this. I want to say, oh, you mean a drug rep didn't hand you a detail piece? Right. Yeah, wow. Great that's, point. Yeah. You know, wow. that's it's yeah. not my, my information isn't being sponsored. <laughs> right? Like if you look up stem cells on Google, Bing or Yahoo, you don't find us. You, you find uh, their, pub, their stuff we've written that you can put the comma in right. If you put stem cells in a Google search, you're not finding it. If you do an organic search, DuckDuckGo, Brave, a tour server, it's amazing what's been published on nutritional medicine, ivermectin, stem cells, bone marrow, amnion, exosomal therapy, new peptide therapy all over the world and a lot in the US. But maybe that's not what your doctor's being paid to read at night. And I feel like I'm, I'm certain I, I get Dr. Brown's got a really busy practice and been busy a long time. It's not like any of us have a lot of extra time to do research. But if you're really busy, what you really develop a kind of a uh, disdain for is when the standard of care doesn't make a lot of people better or you get to see it has a significant downside and there's something you know about that doesn't have a significant downside that you can make people better with right yeah the um let me explain real quick why when you texted me i dropped everything and came over here oh. Because, Jeez, which I can't yes. believe. Yes. Like I got clearly, Dr. Brown here. I'm, clearly, you have the the knowledge and everything, but this is a you know I sort of walked the walk here. Like I, I don't know if you two know this, but so whatever it was, two and a half years ago, around there, yeah. I'm with my son who's uh, who plays tennis for UT. I know OSU over there, but uh, yeah, that's okay. He's, that's a, a, he's a Longhorn, so I, I went to a lot of school at that Orange place. Yeah. 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 So um. And, I'm with him, traveling with him for he's at a, a tennis tournament in the middle of nowhere, like two hours outside of Cancun. We're staying at um, essentially a dorm and I fell asleep weird and I've done jujitsu for years and I've had a lot of trauma and did sports and did all that. So I know that I got some arthritis and stuff and it's like the worst case scenario. It's the middle of COVID. I wake up and I'm just like, oh my God, my, my neck hurts. And I go to push off the bed and my tricep doesn't work. And I've got my son there that I can't panic and I'm like in the middle of nowhere. It's not like I can just run down and whatever. And so I'm trying to tough it out a little bit. We had a couple more days. I come back and first thing I do is I call anesthesia buddy of mine. I was like, dude, I did something bad to my neck. He's like, well, just come in. Um, I'll inject it. You'll be right as rain. And 
then I became part of the traditional side of the medicine. So we're talking a we're, steroid injection. We're talking something. a steroid injection. I, but I was in so By someone much, who thinks they're yeah. doing the right thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, like, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, but like he has one tool. He has, that's, 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 his, that's his nail. But right? when you're sitting here and you're like, I make a living doing stuff with my hands and I can't, my tricep isn't working and, you know, everything goes through your head. Mm -hmm. You're just sort of desperate. Yeah. And the amount of pain, by the way, oh. with the cervical disc yeah. is just unrelenting. It right? was, like you yes. can't put one finger. It's from the neck between your shoulder blades, the back of your arm, you're getting your hands going down. It's miserable. So I go in to this, their surgery center, which is owned by a hospital system and kind of had sticker shock because I have this high deductible insurance like all of us have now. Right. Yes. And, mm -hmm. you know, $1,800 just to walk in the door. Right. And then I go back and I get the injection and didn't do anything. So, you know, he's texting me. He's like, you feeling better? And I'm like, not at all. Like, mm -hmm. Nothing's happened here. He's like, well, come back for another one. It, sometimes it takes four to five. So yeah. what's the distance and time between the two injections? How long are we talking? Well, maybe a week. Yeah, probably yeah. pushing a little bit more. So, we'll, we'll so you're starting if to hit it's that a friend, button. you're probably pushing the envelope of a week, right? Yeah. You're, not, yeah. you're not saying come back in a couple of weeks if you're not better. Yeah, I mean, I was like, I mean, I'm essentially panicking and worried about the future of my ability to work. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I had this, and, and I'm, you know, I love working out. And so it, I had this whole area of my pec that just denervated. And it was like this, oh. just complete, yeah. And I just had this dip and. I'm trying to. Which everything. in me, I'm you probably to... wouldn't be able to see, but in you, it would be an obvious. Well, it's just me, right. Like you can. Yeah. It happens quick, right? Like muscle atrophy from Very the nerve fast. degeneration. Mm -hmm. Very fast. I mean, if the nerve isn't working, the muscle goes away. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and so then, yet I'm like, okay, forget this. And I texted you, and I was like, I got this, and you're like, come in. And so I went through your whole process of coming in, having the meeting with you, discussing everything, looking at it, and then I go back to my wife and I say, I'm going to get stem cells done. What does she do? She Google's and finds mm -hmm. no somebody went blind doing that and somebody had this and, you know and i'm like just watch the podcast this is the guy that i'm going to do it with i mean he knows more about it during his mm -hmm. fellowship training he was doing this stuff when nobody else was doing it mm -hmm. and then i go in for the procedure uh, you had me on you told me what to stay off because you're like ibuprofen and these things they're going to be horrible for the stem cells i need you on this um we talked about doing uh you know i doing a little cervical traction, the bullfrog tape. Like you gave me yeah. techniques to get me through till it was time. And then I tried to hack it a little bit. And I did a, um, if you're familiar with fasting, if you do like a four to five day fast, when you re-eat, you turn on your own stem cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I had it all planned out. Right after mm -hmm. I got my injection, we were going to HG Supply and I was going <laughs> to refeed over there. So I show up I and that. your staff is amazing. Kept me totally calm. Uh, next thing I know, I'm giving a little propofol and I'm like waking up. I'm like, Oh, are we going to, do we need to do it? And they're like, no, you've had the bone marrow already. We've spun it down. You brought in a, a pain doctor who was able to float a catheter in a very difficult way. Yeah. Felt nothing. I just woke up and went, what? Yeah. We're done two and a half years ago. And I mean, I'm 99.9% .9 better <laughs> yeah. every once in a while. If I can't lift enough, I I'm like, ah, he should have put more in. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, but, but again, as, especially as physicians, right? Like, you know who to call when you need something traditional and, and who the guy is locally, right? I mean, we, you know who you refer stuff to. When, when you went to that route, you were told you need surgery, right? Like oh, I'm leaving that second, big- Second epidural, yeah. you're like, hey, um, not only do you need surgery, but like now you're losing your pec, your triceps weak, you need surgery now. Well, so I was told that, um, you know, I got the MRI mm -hmm. and the pain doctor's like, you need to go get surgery. And, and he goes, and you know, I want you to see this person. I said, I thought you used this other person. He's like, oh, we had a little bit of falling out, and, you know, and, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. and I've had neurosurgeons as patients and they basically, the neurosurgeon will say, whatever you do, try to avoid surgery at Every all costs. Yeah. So then that's when it was like, this is no, I'm not doing that. Um, so yeah, I was told I needed urgent surgery right. which is what i would have told you right i mean look i know exactly that pattern just like you know exactly the pattern from the re regular gi guy because you've been that guy right i mean it's not like you were born into having all the cool toys you had to work hard to increase your exposure to figure out what to do for people the the good news is now i think we've been it, it it's it's way more than than obvious that if I can help your body do a better job of healing in a less invasive way, I'm not 
giving you more challenges to get over. You don't have part of your pec, your triceps getting weak. I'm gonna do surgery on, I'm gonna open up your neck, I'm gonna decrease the vascular part of that disc. I'm gonna take bone out of your hip or a plug. I'm gonna jam that in between those vertebrae and I'm gonna put a big plate on it. And now the stress that your body normally would have at that level that could heal and kind of calcify on its own and, and still be functional, but it could move, it's not gonna move so much stress above and low, so you're not gonna get adjacent level. What's published with adjacent level failure after one level fusion is like 30% of the next five years, right? So you're gonna, we're gonna fuse one level because I know you're gonna end up having to fuse another level down the road. But with, we, and so we know all that about the challenges it can give you, but instead, if you pull back from all of that, what can I do to let your body heal faster, take that inflammatory change out of that nerve root where you can kind of stand a chance to get your pec back. If I cut on you, you don't, Yeah. right? So if, if your triceps weak, so fast forward, I had surgery about 10 years before you were a patient when that was what we did with cervical, and two, two cervical spine surgeries. And I've still got about a 30% defect in my right triceps wow. right? as far as functional strength. I didn't have cells put in at the time, right? To avoid surgery. So now have I had cells put in there now? Sure, because it made a huge difference in the functional scar, made a difference in what I can tolerate without getting, you know, pain between the shoulder blades and all that. Um, but if I could, you know, I always look back and think, man, like most of what we do, I've came up with or figured out because of a problem that someone was having that I cared about, right? Um, uh, a patient, a uh, family member, another physician, and you have to go on the, the hunt a little bit for, man, what's the not, what, like, here's what we do that standard of care, but here's what I would kind of like to avoid in that guy, right? And so since then, you know, I'm a huge fan of you and of the stem cells. And so I've probably, I don't know how many, I've, I've had a handful of patients that you've done. And while I have the conversation, I'm like, you know, you should really consider stem cells for this. He's like, oh, I have, it didn't do anything. I'm like, yeah. No, you didn't. You didn't <laughs> yeah. had stem cells yeah. yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stem cells in quotation. You, yeah. Stem yeah. cells, yeah. And me having to say, look, I really need you to go here mm. because whatever you had before really was not true stem cells. You could get into it. You did it on our podcast discussing how many ways these cells uh, can be damaged along the process. Oh, yeah. how many it's way, it's way harder to do it right than it is to do it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah, man, everything in medicine is that way, right? Like, a lot of guys can do it. Getting a guy to do it right is yeah. really important. But when the cells are are the ultimate judge, right? Not a patient mm -hmm. outcome. Because really it's about how many do I get? How many could I keep alive? What's the volume I can get from you? If you do the draw wrong, you're not, I mean, it's really easy to get a draw that has one third the volume of what the draw should have. Because that cell used to be called a pluripotential undifferentiated adherent cell. Meaning they don't want to leave where they were at, right? So. If you see platelet cell activation, if we don't do that draw till after surgery started, I'm not getting the same volume from you because your body is so good. I don't know who designed this, some really intelligent um, design that, of what this organism is we walk around in. But the intelligent design of that body means that it saves those cells for more important things than a minor surgery. Like you're secreting those for, it's like if, you, if you're like, if you're, you know, freezing death, you lose fingers, toes, nose, ears, but man, your body does a really good job of shunting everything to the heart, lungs, brain, because it needs those to live. Those will be the last things to freeze, right? That's the same thing it does with stem cells, right? So it's only going to mobilize cells. Either we mobilize it for the body and get them to go, or you mobilize it with some trauma, but your, your body's ability to get those cells there are tainted by time, trauma, UV light. Radi uh, chronic irritation, in inflammatory disorders, bowel problems, immune system stuff, right? So a lot of times I have to take those cells, concentrate and put them where they go because the body needs me to help it shunt away from what it would have thought was more important than me growing back some hair or getting rid of some, my, I want my face to be smoother or I want my hip to not hurt when really I, I'm broken everywhere, but it's my hip killing me most, right? So I don't just put the IV, now IV cells work because it's going to lower your overall inflammatory load. It can make a huge difference but we're targeting therapy for where you hurt most, I got to kind of trick your body into putting it as the most important thing. So you've done 20,000 of these, or whatever. I, my patient experience, I have now had patients low back fixed. And this is not the infomercial. This is me seeing my patients because mm. they're taking my word for it. I'm like, you need to try this guy. And they'll come back. Low yeah. back done, knee done. I want to say one was an elbow. 
And then, of course, we saw my co-host, Eric Rieger, in like whatever it was, a week after mm-hmm. rotator, rotator cuff, cuff repair. Yeah. And he's doing this. On the first episode, you're making fun of him for a shoulder thing. Yeah. I'm like, I got one of those also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, Eric, Eric, Eric was a great example, right? Because, um, it, it, and, and really, it's, I think Eric's mom. Oh, Eric's uh, mom. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, me, you, you, she had a knee done. Yeah. I mean, it's been, it's like, it's one of those things that when you find out, when you see someone go through it that went through it traditional, and you get to see what you, so you, you know, plenty of people that have had fusions. Oh, do you know anyone that had the recovery you've had? Not me, None. right? I mean, I, I, I mean, I, as a surgeon that sees a lot, I mean, most people, like you can have a couple, you can have some good time. You can have a, some intervals where you do better. You're never better than you were before you had the problem. And, and it's not uncommon for us to get your body functioning back kind of on all cylinders again. If I can get you to just kind of adopt some of the program for, nutrition, wellness, the right vitamin supplementation, if I can get you down down the road and treat the chronic inflammatory order with cells, it's not uncommon to be able to get your body to focus on that and, and, and heal. I think one of the important things of me going through it also was that you had prepped me about everything that was going to happen. And this is, you're going to, it has anti-inflammatory components, but that's not where the real magic happens. Right. Mm-hmm. Magic happens. Magic will be better that day. Exactly. Right. It's going to be later. And I just watched it just... It was like a jet taking off. It was real slow at first where I'm like, man, I hope this works. Well, I hope up this and works. down, up and down a bit. And then a little bit, you know, but yeah. I'm trying to push it. I'm at work and I'm, mm. you know, trying to, you know, I'm scoping and everything. Yeah, yeah, and you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're trying to keep a straight yeah, Because face. the question, Kenneth, is, well, how much time do I need to take off? And I was like, dude, not like wh- whatever you can do now, you can do. Like you can't make the cells not work. Yeah. Matter of fact, the more you do, the more stress you're putting on it, the more the body knows where they need to be, right? So people that just lay around don't do anything, the cells are going to go to the area of greatest need, even though I'm trying to focus where they go. So when you start back doing stuff, you, you literally raise the bar for what's possible, right? So we don't peop- make people non-weight bearing. I don't maybe, now I don't want you going out and, you know, doing jujitsu right away. Sorry. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but for the most part, like the, the body needs some stress to be able to react to, right? To remodel and heal. So I went all in on this. And the one thing that I did do is I did the IV therapy also. So I came back every couple of weeks. Ugh, I forgot his name. You're um, Dr. 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 Phillips. Dr. Phillips. Dr. Yeah. Phillips. Had a great, I, I enjoyed it because your staff is so cool. And I would just hang out and they'd, oh. they'd laugh and joke. And then I'd go to eat it, you know, the HG supply right yeah. afterwards. It mm-hmm. became my little routine. Mm-hmm. So I did three different IVs. Can you, I don't know how often you do that for your patients. Uh, more now even than before, right? Okay. Because... Um, I think that the the changing of someone's overall systemic inflammatory load is crucial. I mean, that you know that like that's what you focus on. I don't have the ability to 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 look inside someone's bowels and kind of make some decisions about where they're headed, but I can help them kind of lower their all overall inflammatory load. And there's a lot of great data on the fact that you know stem cells can only do three things, right? They, they provide the peptides, proteins, messenger RNA what we will label mm-hmm. now exosomes or what they secrete to help areas heal. They lower the inflammatory load, like it's the most potent anti-inflammatory out there. There's even a peptide called LL37 secreted by the stem cells. And we tell people all the time, I, a, a, a stem cell secretes four or 5,000 peptides and proteins. I can write you a script for about 20, right? Yeah. And one of them is LL37. But LL37 is a primary anti-inflammatory mode and, and, and bacterial, and it kills bacteria, right? So it's a bactericidal too. So you get these big anti-inflammatory compounds, interleukin proteins, the methylmetalloproteases, all these interactions that lower the overall inflammatory load. But now what we know that I didn't know when I took care of you a few years ago is that those stem cells, when we talk about the immune modulation, they literally change the DNA expression of the cells in the injured tissue. It's like with chronic lower extremity ischemia, like critical ischemia, CLI or PAD. When you get peripheral vascular issues and you put stem cells in there, it literally changes the inflammatory gene expression of the surrounding tissue. I, that's really well published over the last five, six years. Had no idea. Like I knew that it, it changes the anti-inflammatory cascade. I knew that the cells I put in secrete. What I didn't know is that they literally change the permeability of the endothelial layer. Hmm. layer. They literally modulate the, the vascularity by not only angiogenesis, 
by, by literally changing the inflammatory expression of the diseased tissue. Wow. And that, so now when, if you put those cells where they need to be that your body can't kind of get them to anymore, it, it's amazing what you can give the body as a building block. Some of that IV hung up the pulmonary parenchyma, kind of secretes peptides and proteins where they need to be. But man, with chronic limb ischemia, you can give someone IV, they don't have flow down there, right? So there are times where you, you still need to take those cells where they need to be, right? To help kind of do the yeah. work. Um, so that's, that, and in the spine, that's what we do. Like we, we put an epidural, I have a pain guy that'll work with because I'm doing, I'm busy back there, yeah. right? Um, and with the cell part of what we do, all we do is put this little epidural catheter up. I, I string it up above the, the level of the pathology. We put a little die where I can actually track the nerve roots in the, in the cervical spine, know exactly what levels we're treating. And then based on where the primary pathology is, what the MRI looked like, where your, where your pain is, we're, we're deciding like what the volume is, what's the mix between the marrow and the amnion based on the patient's health status and all this. And what we're doing differently than what I even understood even two years ago now is we're literally treating the inflammatory adhesions of the cord with, because we're not using any local anesthetic, we're not using any steroids because those are both cytotoxic to the cells like on contact. I, there, I would love there to be an anesthetic I could expose stem cells to and then kill them all, but there's not. So when I do that to you, there's no local in your neck, right? Like we both know when you get a pain management shot, like I had a bunch. Mm -hmm. um, while the local's in and the narcotic effect, you got a little bit of relief. But the minute that you're counting on the steroid to do its job, if that disc is pushed on, it was miserable, right? With the cell part, what we're doing now is when you change that inflammatory environment, you're breaking all those adhesions loose, but I'm not just breaking the adhesions loose with something that's gonna cause them to come right back. It's not catabolic. We're breaking it loose with the biologic that can kind of bathe and change the inflammatory load, change the permeability of the capillary beds within the cervical spine, right? Really well published. And now because we're breaking all those adhesions loose, your body, there are plenty of people that on MRI have no room in their neck. Like it's not about stenosis, it's about function and pain. And it's about the rapidity with which it came on. It's about the, the structural environment behind the canal, right? Do you think that God made the neck with no leeway? No, he made it with plenty of room to age and get older and have trauma and still function. But inflammatory load, you're being metabolically broken, right? Makes it where we have to change that inflammatory involvement with the kind of tissue that won't cause you to rebound. And if we break all those adhesions loose, you're going to see a dramatic difference in the inflammatory load pretty early. You're not going to heal that tissue. Real tissue layover, new, new tissue growth starts around six weeks, and 90% of it happens between about week 6A and about week 16, 20. But the, the inflammatory environment going away can happen within the few, first few weeks pretty easy. You can break loose some of the adhesions around a nerve root. It's not uncommon for people to have a pretty quick reaction. But where you're at at six months is what we care about because any new tissue you get, you get to keep. And if we can reset your inflammatory load from your trauma, you get to heal from your trauma. And now you should be where you were before, you know, without as big a mark left by everything you went through before me. Yeah. yeah. Hearing all that, you got to imagine you and I are on the board at a big pharma company. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, stem cell therapy, it's our biggest competition. Right. We just need a drug to do all that. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I need a, I need the, a drug the to do everything are buy the human body. Yeah. I, need the, I need the drug to do everything that the, they're going to get the human body to do for itself. Yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Brown, you know, we always talk about how providers specifically are the worst patients. Uh, we've also talked a lot about reducing inflammatory load in the body. So, in recovery, what are some things that you did from your perspective with your specialty uh, in order to promote quicker healing? Right. You've uh, talked a lot about overall health and it stems in the gut. So so what are some things that we can look for to, to help promote that with patients after they have a procedure done? So I just continued what I've tried to do, which is I know that inflammation is aging. Inflammation mm -hmm. is disease. Mm -hmm. So how do I keep that inflammatory process down to let the stem cells do their stuff? Diet. I don't eat processed foods. I personally try to 99 percent gluten free. Yes. sleep and that was the thing i was terrified when I, I, if you can't sleep due to pain oh. but fortunately i, I was no easy way right like yeah. mm. you start out in the bed you end up on a couch oh. in a chair on a left yeah mm. yeah so you know so diet sleep movement mm -hmm. and so even though i couldn't do my normal workouts i was doing lots of just mobility 
just you know sure. stuff just staying active yeah mm -hmm. and i think that's the biggest thing now the other thing is is that i'm a big we do the research that i've been doing is on the group of molecules called polyphenols and so that's where we use a lot of polyphenols and we know i when i get my blood work done i'm checking my you know highly sensitive crp seeing if there's any movement in that and things mm -hmm. like that and it's when you eat an anti-inflammatory diet but then if you can supplement with these polyphenols that's what i'm doing uh, I think that that made a big difference. I know that when Eric got his done, he's in the same exact boat as me. You know, we do the same sort of similar lifestyle, take the same polyphenol blend. And his recovery was just, I mean, he's hes convinced that that played a role with it. Oh, I'm sure. I, 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 I Again, you know, the analogy of growing grass on concrete, you can. Why make it that hard for it to grow, right? Like, Throw, throw the seed on ground, wet it, put some fertilizer on it, and give it an actual chance. And that's kind of what nutrition, the, the, not taking anti-inflammatories, but addressing the inflammatory status of the human body, right? A matter of fact, a lot of the anti-inflammatories, especially over-the-counter, um, you know, uh, Advil, Aleve, um, actually impair the cytokine cycle directly where the stem cells are starting to work. The only ones that don't are ones that are different part of the inflammatory, so the COX-2. So Mobic and Celebrex are probably fine. But Advil and Aleve, like you're really muting the effect of what your body's. And look, spine surgeons tell you that all the time. We won't even, we, not me now. I haven't done a fusion in, you know, since 05, 06. Um, we, we used to take people off the all anti-inflammatories when you're doing a fusion because it keeps the fusion from healing. If someone has a fracture right now, if, you're, if you have a broken bone and you're taking a bunch of Advil and Aleve, stop because you're keeping, you're limiting what your body's trying to do by healing that fracture. That's really well published. Almost no orthopedic surgeon even tells a patient, look, you need to stop taking Advil while you have this break until you heal because you're causing yourself to be at a much increased risk of a non-union, meaning your fracture not healing. That's not, that's not controversial, really well published, just not talked about. And I don't, I don't know why, but just a quick shout out to, to you guys. Like when I was on you guys show a few years ago, I was kind of a metabolic mess. I was working 100 hours a week. I weighed 310 pounds. Um, and, you know, when you're, and, and I have all the same excuses that, that, that I did then. But when I met Dr. Brown and, and Eric, and, and I'd known Eric for a while, and you look at those guys and know, you know, they don't work any less than I do. <laughs> oh, like, I, like, I need, like, I have access to all the coolest toys in the world, and they never used any of them on me, right? And so for me, it's been, um, you know, that was part of the inspiration to turn around because I never look in the mirror. I shave in a shower mirror, right? Like I don't look in the mirror. That podcast still being out there. And when people will watch that and be, come in and say, oh, Dr. McKenna, I saw this. And I'll be like, oh, Lord. Because I went back and watched that. And I looked like a giant mushroom sitting on the table next to you. And, and all I can think is, Lord, dude, when, how did you get like that? Like you went to college to be an athlete. Like you... Like, how did you get like that? How did you let yourself get so metabolically broken? And, and it didn't happen overnight, right? But it happened because my attention was focused on a lot of other stuff. And, man, taking care, being, being part of that and having to go back and look at that, the first time I ever really see me repetitively on tape was, was eye-opening. Well, I want to thank you for getting a little fluffy because you learned that <laughs> with, with, without, I, without that yeah. commitment. Yeah, you know, if you would have shown up just all shredded, I'm like, yeah. have you done your homework? Yeah, it's like, yeah. Really you, you're doing. Exactly. are you really sacrificing for your passion? I right? do like, have a couple of questions before we close off this last episode for you, Dr. Brown, just to give a clear perspective. So, how long has it been post your procedure with Dr. McKenna since you've been 99.9% .9 healed? I you think felt? it's two and a half years. Two and a half years, maybe a little bit more, probably more. And how maybe? many procedures have you done? I did one. Just one. Okay. I did one and then the three IV infusions. Yeah. 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 And then um, is there any been any downside to any of it? There has been zero downside. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Fact, yeah, the plug no. right there. The end. Back, it was uh, yeah. three weeks ago that the woman that was terrified I was going to get this done yeah. because she Googled all these side effects had her shoulder, neck, yeah. and ankle yeah. done. My wife. That's yeah. right. I was about who, to wrap her yeah, up too again. Even, like, I wasn't going to bring her, her into this because, you know, when she came to the clinic, she didn't even bother to tell me who she was, right? Oh, I didn't know that. So yeah. I didn't even know she was a doctor until pre-op before she said, yeah, I, and, and the anesthesia guy asked, hey, so what do you do? And she's like, I'm a physician. And I was like, what? Like, you're, like, you know, that would have, like, 
I like that knowledge. And, but she was being treated when she came to see me for the wrong diagnosis even, right? Like they were talking about all of her pains in her shoulder. And even in her, and you know that she knew kind of, because when I brought up her neck, she was like, no, no, it's not my neck. And I'm like, you have pain between your shoulder blades? She's like, yeah. Is it kind of numb and tingle? Yeah. Is it all right here when I do this? No. And I'm like, you know, I think some of this is coming from your neck. She goes, I just don't want it to be my neck. When I think it. <laughs> but it makes so much sense, right? Because yeah. there, there's something, you know, she came in for shoulder pain. As it turned out, yeah, she has, she has some changes in her cuff. And that's why the failure rate is even higher than 30%. The failure rate of rotator cuff surgery is 30% on MRI. The failure rate of treating someone's shoulder pain with surgery is much higher than that. Because a lot of times they didn't do the, they don't have the right diagnosis. There's a lot of shoulder pain that's caused by a disc in your neck. There's a lot of shoulder pain that's caused by a cubital tunnel. There's a lot of shoulder pain that's caused by a carpal tunnel. There's a lot of shoulder pain that's caused by a lot of things other than just a rotator cuff tear. And your wife was a great example of that, right? It's been a bit. How has she done? She's doing good. It's been, yeah, it's been, it's been three weeks. Yeah. yeah. It's, so and it's not like, um, you know, it's one of those things. I just wait to hear the, the, yeah. Yeah, you wait for the good starting phases. Right? Yeah. The aches yeah. and pains are just mm. not doing that. I mean, we went to port. I literally just got back from Portugal just a couple of days ago. And I mean, we walked, it, it's one of those countries where you just walk and walk and walk and walk and hurt. I, mean, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't want to bring it up. I didn't want to jinx it. I was like, yeah. I said a word about her ankle. Ankle held awesome. up, right? That's good. Awesome. Held up. Yeah. So she has great. really significant scarring after a bad fracture where her perineal tendons along that lateral side are just kind of scarred in and really degenerative looking, right? Just dried out. That's, that's the, the adult tissue does. It desiccates. That's the aging. That's the inflammatory process, the lack of water signal. And so when that tissue is not nice and pliable and healthy, it hurts and it swells and it gets adherent into the tissue a bit around. All we did is inject those tendon sheaths, kind of break loose a little bit of the scar and, and give that tendon a chance to not be all dried out and desiccated. Well, it makes sense now that you described that the tissue around it, there's angiogenesis yes. and DNA changes and things like that. And she is a physical medicine rehab doctor. Her job is to take care of people yeah. post-surgery for these kind of things. Mm. She never had heard of stem cells during her training. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, 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 it's silly that medical students show up not knowing the answer to what's the first step of wound healing. What's really pathetic is I don't know that I'd ever let a surgeon cut on me that didn't know that too, right? Maybe. Well, what we know now is, has drastically changed even over the last, as we said earlier, two and a half years. Um, so, so real quick, as we kind of draw this to, to a conclusion, um, for patients that are interested in learning more about gut health and healing and, and reducing inflammation over their entire body or meta inflammation, uh, what's the first step with, with your office? You know, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, just let's get a, a plug. Easy, yeah. The yeah. easiest thing is just Kenneth Brown, mm -hmm. com. book an online appointment there. We have the gut check project is our podcast where we that's have a lot of informational right. stuff out there. And that's, um, and if you really want a, a, an anti Western medicine standpoint on that, that, that approaches things from real science, gut check project is a great place to start to know that you're not being misled. You don't have to watch. So the, how do we find you? YouTube, Spotify, Apple? Yeah. So on Instagram, it's gut check project. Everything's, you know, mostly gut check project because I kind of feel like, um, this is, a, platforms like this are just a great way to get to reach more people and so i've kind of absolutely pulled everything away from kenneth brown to just get check project because mm -hmm. you end up learning a ton mm -hmm. when you have experts on the show and, and it, it changes your perspective it opens your mind up we've we've done a lot of docs that have um you know had some bad repercussions due to them speaking out uh, when the pandemic hit and We've interviewed them and you realize how intelligent they are and how smart they are and all they are is just being cutting edge thinking outside the box a little bit so thinking about anatomy and physiology and science instead of politics right it, yeah. it can be uh, harmful to your medical career yeah well, so. this has Thank you been so amazing so much was learned so much was shared and can't wait for the third episode thank you dr ken Brown. No, thank you so much and just yes. love all the work that you guys are doing <laughs> it's one of those things where my sister just came to visit she was here this past weekend and she was in a bad car wreck and had cervical thing and now they're talking about doing her lower back and i'm like absolutely well, not we will said, see her soon yes i said <laughs> if this is if this does not get better you are getting stem cells it's one of those things where i mean you'd hate to be there going why didn't i know that right 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 mm. but yeah. which is which is god you know that there's so much you know when patients will ask how, how can we not know well because you're being paid to not know right that we're fighting a pretty big uphill battle on just optimizing health
which shouldn't be, that should be the foundation of medicine, not the battle that we subscribe to as physicians, right? Well, let's All continue right. the battle. Thanks so much. I, man, <laughs> I really appreciate, appreciate you coming yeah. out. Right. Thank there's, you, everyone. There's no downside to continuing the battle. There is right? zero no downside. downside.